and defend the Constitution, so help me God. Soundly applauded by most for his forthright and reasoned stand in Houston, Kennedy would next face a far larger audience. Challenged by Nixon, he had quickly agreed to join in a series of national television debates. When that uh, offer came, I mean, it took us about 10 seconds to decide that we were going to accept that offer. I mean, we had nothing to lose. Richard Nixon had a worldwide reputation as a debater. Uh, I mean, he'd come off the kitchen debate with Nikita Khrushchev when he'd been in the Soviet Union. His reputation as a debater was made. John Kennedy was a relative unknown. And the main problem was how to deal with Nixon, how to be firm but not insulting, how to uh, handle Nixon. My colleagues and I on the staff uh, spent hours quizzing him briefing him, cross-examining him. Uh, we prepared uh, uh, little index cards on virtually every issue. Nixon didn't have the stamina, by the way, that Kennedy had. That's a big factor in this matter of how you look and how you act. When the time came for the debate, he was like a uh, well-conditioned fighter brought to the peak of his uh, fighting ability. I come out of the Democratic Party, which in this century has produced Woodrow Wilson and Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman, and which supported and sustained these programs which I've discussed tonight. Mr. Nixon comes out of the Republican Party. He was nominated by it. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged, development of the Tennessee Valley, development of our natural resources. I think Mr. Nixon is an effective leader of his party. I hope he would grant me the same. The question before us is, which point of view and which party do we want to lead the United States? Mr. Nixon, would you like to comment on that statement? I have no comment. It's difficult to blame the four Republicans for the eight Democrats not getting a something through that particular committee. I would say further that to blame the president and his veto power for the inability of the senator and his colleague to get action in this special session uh, misses the mark. When the president exercises his veto power, he has to have the people behind him, not just a third of the Congress. Because let's consider it. If the majority of the members of the Congress felt that these particular proposals were good issues, majority of those who were Democrats, why didn't they pass them and send to the president and get a veto and have an issue? The reason why these particular bills and these various fields that have been mentioned were not passed was not because the president was against them. It was because the people were against them. It was because they were too extreme. Let's look at these bills that the vice president suggests were too extreme. One was a bill for $1.25 an hour for anyone who works in a store or a company that has a million dollars a year business. I don't think that's extreme at all. And yet nearly two-thirds to three-fourths of the Republicans in the House of Representatives voted against that proposal. Secondly was the federal aid to education bill. It was a very, uh, because of the defeat of teacher salaries, it was not a bill that uh, met, in my opinion, the needs. The fact of the matter is, it was a bill that was less than you recommended, Mr. Nixon, this morning in your proposal. The third is medical care for the aged, which is tied to Social Security, which is financed out of Social Security funds. It does not put a deficit on the Treasury. The proposal advanced by you and by Mr. Javits would have cost 600 millions of dollars. Mr. Rockefeller rejected it in New York said he didn't agree with the financing at all, said it ought to be on Social Security. So these are three programs which are quite moderate. I think it shows the difference between the two parties. One party is ready to move in these programs, the other party gives them lip service. About 85% of the people who made a decision to vote for or against a candidate as a result of the debates did so on the basis of the first debate. These studies show that while the overwhelming number of people who saw the debate believed that John Kennedy had won them, an equally overwhelming number of people who only heard the debates, didn't have a television set, thought that Richard Nixon had won them. So it was the combination of what you were saying plus how you looked as you said it that was so important. Kennedy was probably the first individual who knew how to use television for political purposes. He had a great personality, he was attractive in appearance, uh, he was very articulate, and of course this new means of projection for a politician was right up his alley. I believe we have to do in our generation what Franklin Roosevelt did in his generation. 
The real crowd started to come out after the first debate. And the next day was like a transformation of the campaign. Uh, all of a sudden, the crowds were bigger. People were yelling, you really got him last night. Go get him again. Uh, he had turned people on by that debate. We start out by having two or three reporters on these trips, and then we'd have five, and then we'd have seven or eight, and uh, I mean, the group got bigger and bigger and bigger until election night, we had something like 400 journalists traveling with us. A Kentuckian. I married a Massachusetts girl. Can you state as evasively as Nixon would under the circumstances, which state, Kentucky or Massachusetts, produces the most beautiful women. Well, I, uh, I will, uh, taking a leaf out of the vice president's book, my wife uh, comes from New York, and therefore I will say that uh, New York produces uh, the most beautiful women. Do you like a man who answers straight, a man who's always fair? We'll measure him against the others and when you compare. You cast your vote for Kennedy and the change that's overdue. So it's up to you, it's up to you, it's strictly up to you. Yes, it's Kennedy, 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 We'd put the candidate to bed and, and sit down with the pilot and figure how late he could sleep. I had figured that he could dress and eat and shave in 27 minutes. Because it's Columbus Day, uh, we ought to have a speech in Italian. Cari amici, mi fa davvero piacere essere tra di voi. Mio marito e io vi siamo grati di tutti i muori per la bella accoglienza. Grazie. The way he campaigned that last two weeks, uh, I'd say we, he averaged between 18 hours and 20 hours a day. He had to pace himself, because as you know, he was always in extreme pain. He had had this back injury uh, during the war, and it never left him. He'd had an operation in 1956. And he had to have stops where he could uh, have a very, very hot tub and sink into the tub and, and relax the pain on his back. I used to be able to get him out of bed in the morning when he'd be exhausted by saying, Nixon's already been campaigning an hour. At last, the great push was over. On election night, the Kennedy...